Bernard, thanks for speaking with WACA prior to the uh, Melbourne event. Uh, we just wanted to extend into some of the discussions that will be going on tonight. And one of the things that you've previously said is that governments by nature are hierarchical in the sense they like to be at the top of the information chain mm. and hold the information. And yet the kind of world that we're now being immersed in through this globalised digital citizenry is one that tends to flatten structures and um, flattens access to information. Mm. So I'm curious if, if that plays out in the natural realm that it will as we move further and further into global citizenry, what do you think that means for the actual structures and the very foundations of our governments and, and democracy? Well, it, for a long time there's going to be a significant tension between governments that have, uh, if you like, grown up in the analogue era when it was very easy to sit at the top of the information hierarchy mm. and control it. Uh, information is not so much, in, in this context, information isn't so much about hoarding, it's about controlling who gets it. Because information is a form of currency and governments use it uh, all the time. Um, and as you say, I mean, this is, this is at odds with the emerging world that we have now that flattens information hierarchies. By that I mean it makes information so much easier to distribute that um, uh, the, the idea of being able to easily maintain control of information um, starts to become even more absurd. Um, classic case is, is allegedly Brad, Bradley Manning um, leaking access to quote unquote beyond top secret uh, information. Now the, uh, the sheer amount of information that was released um, was staggering by any historical uh, comparison. I mean it's, it, often the comparison is made with the Pentagon Papers um, but they were, that was a relatively small amount compared to the sheer volume of documents. Now, that's because uh, uh, digitisation of information and the internet means that the, the old days of information distribution by paper, which was all a matter of grams per square metre, uh, is now all about zeros and ones. And it's far, far easier to actually um, uh, 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 distribute information. So that, the, the ease of distribution is a key issue in uh, confronting governments that have really are used to the idea of being able to control uh, information. This tension is going to continue to play out and that's it's one of the reasons why uh, governments are so anxious about the impact of WikiLeaks because it represents you know the, the, the raw um, edge of what is sort of coming down at them which is a world where information is much much harder to secure and much much easier to distribute. So following on from that if if we're living in an era where you know government's trying to control information and we're increasingly moving into a world where that's harder and harder to do and WikiLeaks has demonstrated or exposed uh, the machinations and manipulations of how that's happening on a geopolitical level uh, do you think then that we're moving into a freer space or a more uh, authoritarian space well that's the that's really that's the outcome of the contest that's now underway, the, the, the fight that's now underway, because it is, it is, it is between uh, uh, do governments and corporations succeed in using the interconnectedness that the internet provides as a means of establishing a surveillance state for all of us, or can we deter them? And do we deter them, and, and how do we deter them? Um, and it's, the important tool, of course, that we've got is that very same interconnectedness that can be used against us to turn it against governments and corporations that want to, want to use the technology. So this is the battle that's underway. And, um, and uh, some days the outcome uh, looks to be as though um, it will be a positive one for, for the community. Other days uh, it's very easy to get very depressed about, um, about, about the likely outcome. I like to try and sort of look back on um, uh, what I call the sort of waves of interconnectedness that society has previously seen. And, um, there have been, in, in, in history, there have been periods when society has witnessed explosions in connectivity between people. Um, the, ref the, the examples I use are, are the Reformation um, and the early trade union movement. Um, the lesson from that is that eventually the ruling elites learn to cope with uh, interconnectivity and the connectedness of, of the communities that they previously control. But that's not, a, that's not until after a long battle to try to prevent communities from connecting up, from uh, trying to resist 
uh, the consequences of interconnectivity. So I think this is the same battle is happening right now. Um, and if we don't fight in the way that, uh, that previous generations in previous stages in history have fought, then uh, we could very easily find ourselves in a, uh, in a situation where the interconnectedness that, that we so prize is actually the main tool by which uh, we are uh, placed in a surveillance state. So at the moment we have uh, a battle going on and it's probably sort of only in its opening stages, so to speak. Uh, and I know for many, um, many people, you know, it's, it's quite often reduced through mainstream media and through government spokespeople to issues around internet filters. Mm -hmm. And I heard you recently say that you know, actually, I can get around an internet filter. Um, what people should be jumping up and down about and more concerned is the more sort of um, subversive ways that it's being infiltrated through legislation, e.g. the extension of ASIO powers, yeah. changes to the Extradition Act, uh, the outsourcing by government to uh, private spying mm -hmm. uh, agencies, which seem to be focusing particularly around uh, activism and voices of dissent as opposed to uh, people that are committing real potential dangers to, to the nation. Why do you think it is that the people are missing this and what are the dangers of what's going on that we're missing? Well, I mean, it, that's, that, that, it's a complex issue, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the problems I think is that there is a sort of a, a fragmentation of uh, uh, the potential activist community. And then the, the most obvious example of that was, was in relation to uh, the internet filter, where you had civil libertarians and what you might broadly call you know, the IT community and, and uh, people with an interest in uh, IT uh, and internet issues um, coming together to express a, a hostile view toward the idea of a filter. But when you start looking at issues like uh, the expansion of ASIO, the, 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 you know, the, the, the almost annual expansion of ASIO powers um, and its remorseless, you know, until recently the remorseless increase in its budget, um, those issues don't engage significant sections of that broader activist community. They don't see the connection between uh, uh, the broader extension of the surveillance state through different means and uh, specific pieces of legislation. It's easy to see the the uh, freedom of speech implications for the internet filter. Slightly harder to see where extending ASIO's powers to uh, 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 adjusting the definitions of ASIO's uh, on, about uh, the things that, that ASIO is permitted to, to keep under surveillance, harder to make that connection. And that's what people need to do is make that broader connection. This isn't just about, this isn't just an internet issue. Uh, that um, the, the war on terror, for example, has been the justification for the extension of all sorts of um, uh, uh, restrictions on our civil liberties, and uh, those relating to the internet are just are just a component of those. So there's this broader picture that I think tends to tends to go missing in a a, um, a, a, a if to, to use a sort of a, a cliche, if you talk about the cyber activist community, I think it's probably somewhat less mature in its development than a lot of other sections of the activist community, and. Um, that sort of that, that I think there is now becoming a greater understanding and appreciation that there it's, this isn't just about things like internet filters. This is about what powers do intelligence agencies have? What powers do uh, police uh, forces have to monitor what we're doing, not just online, but but when we use a phone, for example? Um, uh, making those connections, realizing that it's part of a broader um, uh, set of. Um, restrictions on our liberties that go to things like uh, our legal rights, if we ever find ourselves charged, what, uh, what access we can have to, to the legal system. Um, once you start to see that these are connected together, it becomes, it becomes a lot clearer that, that there are battles going on all over the place, not just in one particular area. This isn't just about um, uh, an internet filter or censorship. It's about what powers can the state legitimately claim uh, for itself. And in reverse, I, I, another aspect I think that, that is missed is there is this constant delegitimization of dissent that is, that is, that is going on and, and there is this sort of definitional creep uh, that's going on with, with, with terrorism. It's now being extended more and more broadly to things that, that really are unrelated. I mean the most recent extension is just this year with the, with the, 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 the uh, argument that computer hacking is terrorism. Now 
um, it's a it's a it's a logically it's a huge leap to make, and yet it's there, there has been no comment, no uh, discussion, no sort of rational uh, uh, analysis of whether this actually stacks up as a uh, you know as a legitimate definition of terrorism. It's, this sort of expansion has been going on for years, and again, people don't make the connection between this and the very immediate uh, the threats that they can see for themselves. Mm. So the, the extension that was granted to, to ASIO most recently was dubbed the WikiLeaks uh, amendments by those in bureaucracy and um, I guess you're in Canberra so you, you would have probably heard talk around that and now they've moved on to streamlining the Extradition Act and one of the interesting components about that is the fact that uh, the definition of terrorism, of course, is within that mm -hmm. and um, the reasons for not uh, extraditing someone for political reasons has also been obscured uh, slightly in that. Do, do you think that these um, changes both to ASIO and the Extradition Act are directly related to Julian Assange? Um, well, the, the official line is that it's nothing, well certainly the ASIO amendment was nothing to do with, with, uh, with WikiLeaks, mm -hmm. that it was long planned. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that may well be the case, but its immediate significance is that it enables ASIO to much more easily spy on those who are engaged in activities like uh, those that Julian Assange has been engaged in or um, uh, uh, people who might be engaged in uh, activities relating to, say, anonymous. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what the, the, the line or the story is from officialdom, mm -hmm. the actual consequence is, yes, this is about making it easier to keep an eye on, uh, on a broader set of targets than, than was, was originally the case. Um, in relation to the Extradition Act, I'm not so sure that it was specifically directed at, um, uh, at the case of Julian Assange. What, what I think again it relates to is more broadly this constant creep of, of, of legislation to, uh, to push the capacities of the state to, uh, to keep an eye on what we're doing, uh, to arrest us if, if it needs to, and to limit our options for defending ourselves if we find ourselves in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes making it easier for us to be extradited. Uh, overseas. So again, it's this, it's this broader issue of the, the, the remorseless creep of the state um, to narrow um, the, the, you know, our basic rights in relation to all sorts of activities, not just in relation to uh, internet or information related activities. Yeah. And I guess that will be further pushed by the cybercrime security bill that's coming up as well. Well, e exactly. And I mean, that, that, is, that is tailor made for another aspect of all this, which is that um, uh, one of the, the important agendas of the United States is to make it, is to facilitate the war on file sharing. I mean, there's the war on terrorism, there's a war on drugs, and there's a war on file sharing going on. Mm. And um, uh, the cybercrime bill, the examples that have been, have been used about foreign governments wanting access to people's data, people talk about, well, you know, the Chinese government wanting access to uh, uh, information about uh, activists on behalf of Tibet. Entirely plausible scenario, but I think more plausible still is the idea that the US government will want to get a, have a good idea of um, people engaged in file sharing because that is a key item on the US government's agenda uh, on behalf of, of, of the major copyright holders. So uh, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, uh, the broader issue in, in this case, um, the fact that the US has this sense of extraterritoriality about its laws, it wants its laws to apply globally mm. and it's uh, uh, one of its sort of major uh, aspects of its diplomacy is to bring about a world where treaties and uh, agreements between the United States and other countries enable that. Yeah. Um, so just finally, I just want to, while, while we're talking about that, I, I can't help thinking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement mm. because that seems to, uh, you know, obviously uh, be very much concerned with intellectual property and copyright and all of those issues. And again, it's another, another example of creeping sort of scope and legislation that's coming in through the back door without scrutiny, uh, which is quite concerning for me as a citizen uh, and an activist. Uh, what's even more concerning uh, in relationship to Julian was the revelation through the Stratfor uh, emails that there's already a sealed indictment 
um, being held on Julian. And I just wonder, um, what do you make of the straightforward emails? Because my understanding is that they do operate within Australia, um, or they have a regional person that looks around mm. this area. Um, and I just wonder what you make of those, because it seems to be that the FBI facilitated Indeed, what, indeed. I mean, that's what the, took place. That's one of the fascinating aspects about this, is it's quite clear the FBI had a role in storing that material before it was released, mm. uh, which is a, a remarkable uh, outcome, but, but, but entirely consistent with the FBI's mode of operation at the moment, which seems to be to facilitate and enable and indeed invent uh, particular crimes and then, then boast that, uh, that they've been sold, uh, that they've been that they've been that they've uh, that they've solved them or, or, or stopped them. Um, for me, the, the takeout from the strat for emails is similar to what I think is one of the broader lessons about the whole about the diplomatic cables from WikiLeaks, which did indeed which contained a lot of important revelations about what the United States is is doing. But for me, the biggest sort of takeout from from those from all those cables was the sheer banality of what. America's diplomats are engaged in. They're not engaged in the high-minded statecraft that foreign, the foreign policy establishment has been telling us for hundreds of years is what diplomats do. Diplomacy has always been dressed up as, as a, a particular sort of combination of an art and a science that ordinary people like us really shouldn't be allowed to, to see because the, the stakes are so high and, the, and it's so complex. Well, WikiLeaks cables revealed was, in fact, it's just like any other bureaucracy. It, it's, a, uh, it's a bunch of diplomats engaged in gossip and representing the interests of companies. Mm. And that sort of, that, that banality, that stripping away of the, of the, of the, of the mystique of foreign policy, um, I think is paralleled in, in the revelations about Stratfor, which is, which is advertised itself as a, as a you know, the, the, the cliched phrase is, is, is the sort of the, the alternative CIA. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, a bunch of people desperately trying to cobble together information um, and sort of uh, splicing together gossip and, uh, and whatever, whatever information they can Google up. Um, so that the sort of the, 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 the unveiling of the, the rather, rather banal reality of foreign policy and intelligence gathering, I think, is, is, what's, sort of is, is what's really on display. And that's, that's important because um, for so long, We've been really sort of inculcated with the view, and that uh, the media has played a role in this, that these things are uh, in some way special and different and should be beyond the reach of normal democratic processes. That's why we continue to have things like um, uh, ASIO doesn't have to, doesn't have to uh, uh, give an account of its operations in public. It can do it to a private, to a, to a, to a, a carefully chosen uh, parliamentary committee. It doesn't have to do it in public. So there is no public accountability for ASIO beyond its rather anodyne annual report. The justification for that is that all this is special. This is different from normal, um, normal bureaucracy. And really, the, 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 for me, the, the, the really significant revelation from all or, or everything that we've seen over the last 18 months is, no, it's not different. It's actually the same. It's actually the same stuff going on as you see going on in, in the rest of the bureaucracy. And we need to be much more aggressive in challenging this argument that it is different and it needs to be shielded and we can't know about it because uh, the stakes are too high. That's, that's uh, as we've seen from WikiLeaks, that's just not the case. So one final question, if, if that is the case, uh, what do you make of the government's response to Senator Ludlam's FOI request around Julian Assange and the discussions that our government may have had with the United States in relationship to him? Well, sadly, it's just, it's typical of um, the, 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 um, the disinterest that this government has, has, has uh, A, treats uh, freedom of information and B, uh, has treated the, the, the case of Julian Assange. The, the, the Rudd government initially reformed FOI. Uh, John Faulkner was in, was, was in charge of the process, significantly strengthened FOI, made it easier, um, uh, didn't get the kudos that it should have got from, from the, the, the commentary about that. It was, uh, it was a, you know, a significant step forward. Since then, it seems to have reverted to type, to reverted to the same um, uh, uh, resistance to freedom of information that most governments um, have always had. But the, 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 the other impression I get from the documents, and, and you know, you can't, there's nothing to read there because, because it's all been, you know, the, the, the old black highlight has been used, uh, used quite liberally, but um, I talked a while, a while ago about the government's curious lack of 
um, desire to know what's really happening with Julian Assange. Um, there's no evidence that it's ever said to uh, the United States, well, what are, you, what are you actually doing about Julian Assange? Do you plan to extradite him? What are your plans for him? Is there an indictment? What are the areas that you think he has broken US law? There's this strange lack of curiosity about, about one of its own citizens and one of its own very, very high profile citizens. When the government seems ever ready to make comments about Julian Assange, most notably um, uh, Julia Gillard re you know, referring to WikiLeaks activities as, as illegal, Robert McClellan making uh, similar statements. Um, it's, it's happy to pass judgment and yet strangely incurious about um, uh, seeking information from its ally about what's really going on. And that says quite a lot to me that, 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 that the government really will only do what it should do about Julian Assange uh, if it's actually pushed. It'll have to be dragged, kicking and screaming, maybe rather than pushed, to, uh, to actually uh, give him the basic protections to which he's entitled as an Australian citizen. Which is a sad reflection of, of the state of our democracy and, and our protection of citizenry rights, really, isn't it? The interesting thing over the last 10 years is, is the development of this sense of entitlement on the part of Australian citizens overseas that they will get enormous amounts of help from their government if they somehow find themselves in some sort of difficulty. Um, Julian Assange strangely seems to have missed out on all of that. Um, he's, uh, his, uh, the level of support that's been provided to him has been pretty minimal. And um, as I said, the level of interest that the government has in what might be in store for him uh, is even less. Bernard, thanks for joining us tonight. Pleasure.